Hello, and uh, welcome to what's unfortunately the last talk of the day, I think, isn't it? I'm, I'm impressed you've turned up. I was expecting no one. You all would be at the already drinking beer. Well, hello, I'm Gareth, and I'm going to be talking about quietly strangling things which we want to be dead, or quietly strangling monoliths, and talk about an actual application I've done doing an actual getting rid of a monolith, and hopefully giving you some takeaways that you can use in your own work and learn from. Uh, so, who am I? Well, it's probably worth pointing out that since I submitted this and wrote it, I have worked in two other places. So this is a bit all over the place in terms of branding. So it is branded for my own company because it didn't make sense to brand it with where I'm currently working. So if you ask who Monkey is, you can ask me later over a beer and I'll explain that. Who am I? I'm an electrical engineer who took a wrong turn and ended up writing software. And throughout my career, I've written probably 30 or 40 different programming languages on platforms that most of you have never heard of. I'm probably one of the only living people who was programmed in Babbage, and if you know what that is, you're a better person than most. Um, and I've sort of moved from working at very low levels to very high levels, and now I just manage people doing real work. And along the way, I've done a bit of agile coaching. Currently, because I've got to plug this, because I'm recruiting, um, I am director of engineering, well, for a company called My Energy, we're building an entire new software team, doing stuff in the eco space, uh, car chargers, solar chargers, all that fun stuff. And I need people, so hit me up later if you're looking for doing exciting things with embedded and cloud services and really high traffic stuff. So, my disclaimers. I firmly believe that generally there is no right answer. There is no definitive way to do things. Computers are constructs that we created with languages that we created to do work that we specify. So there isn't really a right answer to any of this. There's the stuff that works and stuff that doesn't. And some stuff works better than others, but there isn't a right answer. So this is what I did. This isn't the way to do it. This is what worked, or sometimes didn't work for me. So what I'm hoping is that by telling you what I have done, and the things I have done with it, that you will learn something, and that maybe it will shape you, and you don't make the same mistakes that I did. Um, right, what am I talking about? A year ago, I was CTO of a company called ScholarPack. ScholarPack is the third largest school management system in the UK. Uh, I joined when they were on 300 schools. When I left, there were just about 2,000 schools, growing 35% to 40% year on year. About 10% of the primary school children in England are managed by that system. And it's a bag of spanners. It was, it was written by a, pri not a primary school teacher, a secondary school teacher in Skegness guy called Gary Saddington, who is a very strange and very clever guy, and he was sick of the admins in his school whinging about how poor the MIS was, so he decided to write one himself. But he wasn't a programmer. So he taught himself Python, he found a thing called Zope, discovered a database called Postgres, and wrote a new an application, and then decided to sell it. So this Zope platform, and I'm guessing probably nobody here has ever heard of Zope either, that that he wrote, had about, when we started rewriting it, over a thousand schools running on something that a, primary, that a school teacher did as a weekend project. And generally, it's a standard setup. We've got Zope. The interesting thing about Zope is it says it's Python, it's not. It's Zope Python. It's a, it's a framework and an application server and an interpreter and a templating language and everything else in one deployment is actually quite an interesting thing back from the pre-Django days. This is 2000, this was the hotness in uh, the Python world, which makes it very interesting, very easy to deploy, very easy to break. And everything inside Zope is in the thing called the ZODB, which is the, Z, the Zope object database. And actually it's quite ahead of its time because it's an object database. And, you know, we're all about object databases these days, but everything Zope is in the ZODB and then at the back end, thankfully, there was Postgres. This was all inside one box. So this was not three boxes. This was one server running all of the services inside the box with some horrible hacks and multi-threaded things to try and make this thing perform. And it's got all the normal problems. 
it's, it was a security nightmare. The passwords were base64 encoded into cookies. Um, I can say that now because that's fixed. <laughs> uh, everything touched everything. More than most monoliths, it was scripted, horrible, hacky files that, we, that could easily pull in the entire system. So a, a deployment is the entire system. You can take the whole thing down with one accidental typo in one place. The dev process was complex. You couldn't use Git. You couldn't use any source control at all because you had to edit it in the web browser. There was no way to push code to it in a reliable way. Also, it did the, the classic last, last to change wins. So you'd end up with two, two developers op with a code editor open. You'd be hacking away. One would save and deploy. And then the other would save and deploy. And the second one would win. But the second one might do it several hours after the first one. So you might have a feature in live. And then the second one would come along and save deploy. And of course, they haven't got the first one's features because they weren't there when they opened it. And I'm going to say none of this is in Git because it is all objects in that ZODB. These are all HTML files hidden inside a facade of, of uh, Python. Um, you probably get that you can't hire Zope developers because we've got a whole room of very talented developers and not a single one of you have ever heard of this thing. So how do you write a job ad going, wanted Zope? You go, wanted Python, and then out day one you go, surprise! Um, <laughs> so it's a bit difficult to hire also, really difficult to onboard. It's not like, here's your standard thing, and everything was quite high risk. Um, everything, is, it's a monolith running in a monolith. So you've got, Zope is doing all the work. You don't know what it's doing, because it's one thread running the entire application. So when it starts falling over, you have no idea why. And when it's on the same box, you don't know which part of the database stack will have crashed it. Um, so I think the only good thing we had, we had to do CD. We had to do it because of the, you know, the problems of last to save wins and no version control. The only way we could get around that was continuously be pushing code to live. You did a change, you put it live. You did a change, you put it live. We were doing 20 to 30 deployments a day back in this bag of spanners because we just no hope of ever keeping up with what's going on unless you were just always running in live, which made testing was interesting and feature flags were everywhere. Um, some other interesting things, uh, the database was faster than the code, so, the, so there was lots of SQL doing very suspect things like generating HTML, generating JavaScript, um, just massive, massive shifting of workloads, because this thing works, so we'll put it there. Uh, so we had to get rid of it. But the big thing is, it is popular. It is still popular. I've been gone a year, but they're still my mates. We chat, and it still outsells the competitors. It is such a popular system. And actually, this is a really interesting point and probably a completely different talk. But Gary Sads, who wrote it, he went, I'm going to write the thing to fix these people's problem. So the system was so focused on what the users actually need to do that you couldn't tear it from their hands. It was just... The, the, the loyalty is insane. Retention rates of over 99%. I think in the time I was there, so I was there for five years, we lost six schools out of 2,000. You know, these, these people love the platform. And you know, that made it such an amazing thing. You know, it sold itself. People would phone up and just ask to buy it rather than have it been a tendering process. So we, couldn't re we didn't want to rewrite it. it was, we had already had the golden the golden egg. It was amazing in terms of functionality, it just maintaining it was horrible. And we also have a very interesting problem. We call it the hug of death. Schools only work between about 8.30 and 5. Overnight, we would have one, maybe two active users across a thousand schools. We, would, we could be getting under 100 requests a second at midnight. At 8 a.m., it starts rising. At the peak, I think this is a, one of the servers, we were getting 3,500 requests per second. There are 10 servers all doing that. And so we go from nothing to, oh my Jesus, back down to something reasonable. 
And, but because of the monolith, we were scaled to run at that level. So we had huge amounts of resource, which basically most of the time was just icing over. The processes weren't doing anything. And that felt inefficient. I'm West Walian, I'm tight as hell. I felt I was paying money for nothing. So, there had to be a better way. But the most important thing is, and the most overriding thing, the market was catching up, the market was moving. Um, the DFE doesn't stop for anyone and requirements come in. Most of what this system does is statutory requirements. We couldn't stop selling, so we couldn't take a time back and wait and take a stable platform. And also, we couldn't stop adding the features the schools wanted, because you know, we needed to keep selling, keep up with the market. So we had to rebuild, I think the CEO at the time described it as rebuilding the, the, the London bus into a Ferrari, but whilst the bus was moving. So I invoked the great Lord Martin Fowler. I went strangle a fig. Uh, does everyone know what a strangler pattern is? In the room. Again, there's lots of nodding. Just wrap it, pretend it's not there, then move the bits out. So, step one. Well, actually there's a step zero, because in Programmer, we put the database in a different server to give us an application server and a database server, which wasn't as easy as you would expect for ZOAP reasons. Um, yeah, that's another, that, again, that's another talk around how does Postgres handle 27,000 open connections. Uh, but, so we move this out. So these are now pairs of application servers in AWS, took the time to go EC2, may as well. And then we built a layer in front, we called the wrapper. And this wrapper became the entry point for all the system. This wrapper is where the users would start hitting. And this allowed us to hide the old and, and cruddy stuff to one side. Sidebar, because everyone talks about microservices, and this gets my goat, because microservices has a very clearly, very well ring-fenced def definition of what a microservice is. And people get very, very hung up. And I'm saying this because I remember the arguments we had internally when I said we're going to do this, and think, well, that's microservices. It isn't, because it constrains your thinking. We're moving into a, into a service architecture. We we're going to start factoring things out. But they're not microservices. They're single responsibility services. They're services that do one thing. But that responsibility is defined by us. It might be an entire part of the application, it might be one API call. But we wanted to move that thing around and we didn't want to be curtailed by what is the microservices and then having versioned APIs and storage and all the other things you get when you go, I'm microservice. So we started building single responsibility services and yes, it is just solid with, with services rather than objects. So, how do we strangle? The first step, and the hardest step, is putting this wrapper in the way. Because this thing has to cope with that hug of death. And not only the hug of death, ten times the hug of death. Because it is now having to cope with all ten, and actually by the time it got live, twelve production servers load through it. And do it in a way that's transparent. So it has to know that this request is for that ZOAP, and that request is for that ZOAP. It has to be really knowledgeable about the internal infrastructure, but transparent to the user. So that took a while. We'll get onto that in a sec. But the most important thing, and the thing we did first, is we fixed the damn auth. So we went from a world of base64 encoded passwords in cookies, which meant that there was no such thing as a user session, to actually having proper sessions and proper storage and actually doing things in a, right, in a nicely standards way. And it meant we suddenly gained some extra advantages, which is Auth now covered all of the ZOPs. Because previously, if you had a login to a server, you had a login to a server. So if you ha were, say, the head who had five schools, and because you know, there's things called multi-academy trust in this country where they have groups of schools, and you wanted to be able to get in and manage several schools, the only way we could do it is by putting you all your schools on one server which meant moving schools between servers to balance them. Because not all schools are made equal. Some of the servers would start creaking at 90 schools. One of the servers had 230 schools. There's lots of different dynamics there 
that meant that we couldn't actually predict how many schools a server could take effectively. We set it to the hundred to be safe. But if, you're, if you've taken over or you've gained a school from, into a mat and it's on the wrong server, suddenly you have to move the school between servers, which means updating the URLs, which means getting new logins, which means moving all the users. And it was half a day's work for a person to move a school. And your logins no longer work on the other servers, so you just couldn't work. Suddenly, with one auth service, you can log into any server, because it, now it become the server number, in effect, becomes a property on the request rather than core to your functionality. And then, we chose a module to move out. So every school loves a bit of assessment. You know, how good are most kids at reading and writing? Um, it was quite a big system. Change wasn't quite fit for purpose, so we went with rewriting the assessment module. And we started by factoring, factoring the code out and making it so that all the requests pass through the wrapper. So as far as the user's concerned, they're still hitting there. It doesn't look any different. And that is serving up all the, the furniture still. So all the headers, footers, navigation, everything else about you is coming from the same place. So that looks the same. This just sits inside the site. As luck would have it, when Gary wrote the system, he bought the theme. And the theme used an iframe. Who remembers iframes? Um, <laughs> to, uh, to embed the actual content. But that made it very easy to do this, because suddenly we could just replace the content of the iframe with our other system. So, you know, horrible, not very good semantic HTML, really easy to uh, insert elements, which is part of the problem with iframes. So we, we factored that out, started writing it. Um, initially, we started just working straight on the database. That came crumbling to a horrible end, so we ended up writing an internal API. And this almost is a monolithic representation of that database. We're getting back to my semantics about, about single responsibility services. We needed a way of representing the data in there without actually making connections into the database from all the services. So we created a standard API. And this actually became our external API as well. So it actually became quite fundamental to our infrastructure. And then it made it very easy to start writing extra modules because we could extend the API to include that. So we took a needs-based approach. We moved things over. That is still running because we never, you know, I, I actually argue that if you're doing one of these rewrites, you will never reach the end, really. Because if the code is working and it doesn't change, why touch it? Just leave it covered in cotton wool and tar and, pray, and, and just pray that one day there'll be so little of it left that, you, will, that you, may as well, you may as well move it out as leave it there. The, the other nice thing is, by going with the internal API, I'm just jumping around a lot now, you only need to implement the endpoints that the module you have needs. So this grows as the modules grow, and you can use Semver. Uh, to make the different modules know, know about breaking changes. So this becomes quite a nice way of managing your database schemas. So now none of our services really care about databases apart from IAPI. So I'm going to get onto the bad and the ugly, but my big, big takeaway for anybody in the room who's ever thinking of doing this, make sure you have a flagship thing to do. If you're going to set off in this going, we're going to rewrite a monolith, you won't do it. There is no business need for it. If there is no actual need in the business to do it, you will not get priority. You will struggle to make the argument. I'd argue to you that you have no need to do it. If it's running and it's not changing, leave it alone. Because the only code breaks when you touch it. It's like glass. So make sure you've got something which has tangible benefits and pick the right one. Get on to the things that went wrong, because that leads nicely into this. Getting confidence to switch was hard. So the hardest part of the entire thing was that entry point, the wrapper, which is just a reverse proxy, just. But you know, it's not a particularly complex thing. You know, initially we thought we could use something like HA proxy to do it. You know, it's it's that thin in what it's trying to do. And then there's, an, there's another whole thing with a beer, if you want later, about why HA proxy didn't work because of Zope. Um, but you know, it's not a huge amount, but it has all the traffic through it. 
So the business confidence in releasing it is low. What they have works. We want to put this thing in place. We lost six weeks trying to trace a bug which turned out to be our DNS provider getting it live. And it must have take, we expected it to go live, I think, in October, and we actually migrated all the servers in February because it took us that long to prove it. I mean, we must have run so many hours of Gatling tests and locust tests and load tests and putting a couple of schools in there. And, and you know, it, it's hard to prove, a, prove that something works. Proving, proving a negative is a very hard. We, you, know, you can show it breaks, but showing it's working is very difficult because they go, ah, but last week we had this bug. Yeah, but that bug's actually inside the other system. No, no, it's the, the wrapper. So, no. We actually ended up creating a URL for internal people that bypassed the wrapper so that they could go and get the same page up without it just to prove that the damn thing was working. Yeah. Second thing, your flagship project, choose the right one. We chose the wrong one. We did, we chose a thing called the student profile, which is like core to the platform. And the idea was, as a senior team, we went, what should we do first? We'll do something that's got big an impact. We'll do the student profile. Unfortunately, that has the most functionality of every module. It does everything. If you want to change something on a student, it's in there. And the coding practices weren't the best in the early days. So there is things that happen in, in JavaScript that may have been suspect. And there are things happening in SQL that may have been suspect. And there was no need. It was stable. Nobody wanted changes to it. There was no new functionality. It was fast. It was quick. People knew where everything was. So we couldn't even go, it's, you're going to get all these extra features. Because they didn't care. It did everything it wanted. Internally, we couldn't sell it. When we switched tack to doing um, an assessment module, because we wanted a new assessment package we could sell, suddenly it gains traction. Suddenly, you can get deployments. And the fact it was a new assessment package, meant that we had something shiny to sell. And also, it meant that we could have the old one just there. We didn't have to turn the old one off. And now, we are to, well, they have left. They are turning modules off. They are actually moving things over and turning it off. And over time, more and more things are arriving there. This can't be the 100% approach of a business, in my opinion. You might have the budget and the time to, spend, to, to dedicate all your resource to it. But we couldn't. I mean, Scholarpack grows at a fantastic rate, but still at, its, at our peak we had 10 devs. That's not a very big team to be doing the work that those 10 devs were doing before and write an entire new service-based architecture. So choosing the right project and having the right things to move and, and the right messaging to the business is hugely important. Most of this project is actually me sitting with support and selling them on it and going, we need to be doing it. The actual coding isn't particularly difficult. It's a standard set of U UI elements and a couple of graphs for one module. And you know, it's not a hugely complex project. It's not a hugely complex product. But you need to make sure that you're taking the business with you and you're delivering value to them. And the next one, sometimes a shortcut isn't. I still remember the meeting with the entire development team where we talked about doing an internal API. I went, oh no, that's too hard. We've got to write all this infrastructure. We may as well talk straight to the database and have a standard set of models we can share in a, re in a repository and just pull them in and go, okay, we'll have a go. And that was horrendous because having a version set of models is painful. It now becomes a build problem for your platform. And we are using Python. And you know, you've know got to work at how to pull that in, make sure that you're versioning the correct models to run against the database. Um, maybe an ORM was the wrong choice, but still having the, that single access point in code you'd pull in didn't work. What we should have done is gone with internal API initially. What we, all, what we should have done with the mistake is recognized it rather than just trying to plow that field. So we pushed for too long Try, trying to make the other idea work, even though it was obvious very quickly it wasn't. We went, well, this is the decision we made. When we pivoted, we turned the API around in about two days, and then we had the other system working against it because there are very good tools for analyzing databases. We've already done a lot of work on creating these models. Went in one place. Those things talked to it. It was easy. And the final one, 
you sh in, in my things that were horrendous, <laughs> we, we went from a, a world of monoliths which are easy to deploy, easy to understand, to a services which had interconnections, and they were working on people's computers. So this is all Docker. It's all actually deployed in ECS Fargate on AWS. So this is all auto-scaling, Docker, all the latest stuff. It isn't Kubernetes because I'm not that trendy. But, you know, it's, it, it, it's that, that world. It's like the diametric opposite to, you know, monolithic Zope servers from 2000. So it was chalk and cheese, and the developers were very used to being able to do their work and then push code and it work. And suddenly we had Docker Compose files, and we had database versions, and schemas, and models, and pip installs, and, and containers to version out and move around. And we got it through quite slick again to work on your laptop. And that didn't work when it went to live, because what works on your laptop is not live, and, and Docker Compose is not ECS and your configuration is not a Helm chart. You know, it's a, so what we should have done is right at the start be working in live. So my biggest takeaway to anybody, and this isn't about this, it's just always be ready to deploy. After the first horrendous level um, deployment, which took probably longer than it took to write the, the internal API, just to get it running in live, we went, this, this isn't sustainable. So we created a thing we call the skeleton which is a prototype service which has all the keys to make it work in our infrastructure. The stuff that allows it to talk to Wrapper, the stuff that allows it to talk to Zope, the stuff that just makes it, puts all the glue in. That, that was the hardest thing to sit together. We just had a raw, this is all Python Flask, so we had just the raw Flask project with all the dependencies right there, so when you pulled it and deployed it, you hit an endpoint and it just went, hello world. And the first step on doing any project is to fork that repo, give it the right names and the right configuration files, deploy it into your, inf into your, into your infrastructure, hit, a, hit the route that you've set up for it, and see it says hello world. And from that point, you're live. And actually, we push that straight into live. So that now, in all new services, within a probably half a day to a day of it deciding to happen, has a service running in the live environment. You can't really get to it. It's sort of hidden behind flags, but it's there and can be pushed to. And from that point on, all changes can just get pushed straight out to live. And whenever problems started occurring, generally is when we moved away from that principle. When we went, oh, it's too big to, to do this, or we need to wait for these things, and then suddenly we get into a deployment problem. Always be live and feature flag, or you're always going to struggle, especially when you're trying to map old functionality onto a module that's trying to replace it because you will never get the agreement and you need to put it somewhere for people to look at and you need to be iterating really fast on it. Inspect and adapt regularly. Also, if you're up against it, don't add new projects. Don't sit in the middle of it and go, what we really need as well is a math management system. What we really need as well is a new enhanced comms module. It's so... Shockingly, it slows you down, but it caused us um, some fun and games, um, and what my learning from there was not negotiating hard enough, not going, actually, you can have that, but we stop this. Don't take on more work than you need. <laughs> but the wrapper, or the wrapper, it's actually codenamed m and because m and is a wrapper. Um, or multiplexing network mask. Uh, that completely changed how we worked, and it completely changed our ability to do work. Suddenly, new functionality was fast. Suddenly, we could have authentication. Suddenly, we could deploy and have A-B testing because we could set that up in the wrapper. Suddenly, we could have analytics. Suddenly, we could, we could measure user traffic effectively. Suddenly we could have alerting and monitoring and, and things right at the front end. Uh, I, it just completely changed how we worked. We wanted to write, you know, your, the management system for a mat. Well, that becomes easy because you've got the, the wrapper. The wrapper can go, ah, I understand authentication. I let that, I can now aggregate the data from these schools. I can see these things. It's another service behind the wrapper that can pick those things out together and work with it. We could never have done that in Zope. So the wrapper went from ponderous, horrible, Russian roulette-style development to 
a really nice rapid way of getting things out and easily deployed. And you know, the unexpected benefit, we got a CDN. The way Zope worked meant that every asset, everything at all was equal. Code or images were all served up as objects from the ZODB. And writing things to push that into a CDN was horrible and the URLs were insane. So we couldn't have a CDN. Some extra rules in the wrapper that allows you to rewrite the content coming through, because you know, we can do that now, because we can see what's going through it. You can insert CDN links. You can factor things out. You can work at, oh, that's a new thing, and push it out to the CDN. So the load on the servers went down. So because suddenly there's a CDN for it to do. We had to put hacks in to enable no caching because of the way Zoop works. So th big images and big files were being not cached and served up every request. We could cache now because this could write, set the things to not cache that needed to not cache and cache the things that the church cache. We could do edge side includes. We could start writing content in effectively. We could do things that probably most of you living in the modern web world just take for granted, but it was amazing for us. Uh, you want to get a third party to write you a module? Okay, you just give them a route inside your infrastructure. They give you a deployment artifact and you just get in and the wrapper sorts out all the correct furniture and the authentication for you. They don't have to understand that. You just have to implement a cookie and know how our internal authentication works, which is a library and an SDK we could share with them. And then suddenly it just works with us. And you know, I've gone on a lot you had one place the schools can access it. You could have one log on for multiple schools with proper role-based access. You could be an admin in one school and a teacher in another. You could be a head in one school and a teacher in the other. You can have peripatetic teachers who have logged into multiple schools managed from one place. And that was all a pipe dream before this. And that is that, really. <laughs>